To mark Rare Disease Day 2022, we are shining a light on rare conditions with Genetic Alliance UK and ITM Productions. Here are the highlights of the programme. My blood pressure went very high and my period stopped. And this was sort of three or four years before I was formally diagnosed. They were both looked into. There was no cause found. I was just sort of told to, to get on with things. The GP prescribed me vitamin A tablets and it did nothing. Coming from a good Lancashire family, somebody brought in some holy water from Lourdes. That didn't do anything. So um, I ended up uh, going to the hospital in Manchester. When I was 15, I had a stomach swelling and my dad took me off to hospital and a male doctor decided that he would have to do an internal because he, I was actually having a miscarriage. Had to then try and explain to him at the age of 15 when my father stood next to me that I wasn't having a miscarriage because I hadn't had sex. Helping patients get a final diagnosis faster is just one of the priorities of the government's rare diseases framework, which is working with the wider rare diseases community to alleviate some of the challenges. So our recommendations include a central source of information for healthcare professionals to be able to supply information at the point of diagnosis, but also a plan for the diagnostic journey so that while a patient's going through that, that process, they, ha they know what care they can access um, and they'll have that care coordinated for them. Companies such as HRA Pharma are trying to ease the challenges of that diagnostic journey and help people to live with their conditions. Even healthcare professionals can struggle to get a definitive diagnosis. Dr Kate Scoffings suffered from Cushing's disease. I went to my GP with the full set of, of what symptoms I had uh, and said, do you think this could be Cushing's? And her immediate response was, no, 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 you can't have Cushing's, it's rare. Um, and I had to push to, to say, well, could you still just test me? Many of the features are uh, non-specific. They're things that a lot of people might experience in their, in their lives, uh, in particular the physical features. And also the fact that actually it is a rare condition means that it's often not really at the top of the list of things that people are thinking about. To get to the diagnosis of Cushing's, you really have to be a good detective in so much as you need to take all those pieces of evidence that are starting to, to fall onto the table, as it were, and, and piece them together. Look. It's me? Well, I look just beautiful. Yeah, Mum. Good job, Ez. Making a simple diagnostic tool available in the UK at birth would have made all the difference to Ezra and his family. He suffers from spinal muscular atrophy type 1, an extremely rare genetically inherited muscle wasting condition. A heel pinprick test when he was born would have revealed the disease with a chance to administer vital medication before his muscles started to deteriorate. He did get access to an experimental drug which saved his life, but the damage was already done. But once the neurons have died, um, they don't come back. Um, so he will still need his BiPAP ventilator at night time. He'll still need to be peg fed. Um, he'll still need nurses um, here overnight with him watching him. He'll still need his SATs monitored. Every time he gets a cold, we still need to be extra careful. It's absolutely crazy that we don't have newborn screening in the UK. If we can find kids like Ezra when they're just born and we can get this drug into them, our lives would be completely different if that was happening when Ezra was born. The cost of the screening is about, let's say, three to four pounds per baby. It means that um, if you, you need to screen 10,000 baby to get a single one um, that you identify. So identifying a patient before the symptoms rather than after the symptoms costs about 30,000 pounds, right? But a life in the wheelchair, a full life in the wheelchair with all compensation with the fact that one of the parents will probably not be able to work with the non-invasive ventilation has been estimated to be between five and seven millions of pounds. So it means that if you invest 30 to 40,000 pounds into the screening of, for identifying the patients, then you can save down the line five to seven millions. If you're aware of a better investment, just tell me, I'll give you my money to invest. We're also looking in the UK now at using genome sequencing as a, a newborn screening tool, um, which could have 
um, a lot of power to uh, rapidly increase uh, diagnoses at, at birth as well. Investment in screening by Genomics England is helping families to manage inherited conditions. Signing up for the 100,000 Genomes Project meant Andy Hart and his daughter discovered he had retinitis pigmentosa and that she carried the gene. It's given me a sort of bigger sense of responsibility. It's not affected whether I want children or not, I'm, I still do. It's more so made me think further about how I go about it and what the actual right decisions would be, not for me, but for my future children. Genomics England is a government-run company which aims to make genomic medicine more accessible to everyone by using genetic sequencing machines that use samples of a person's DNA to identify conditions they might have. The implications of doing this at scale are huge because we can start to deliver on that vision of a health service which is predictive and preventative rather than coming in and treating sickness, we can get ahead of it. And that means that we can start to understand more and more on the basis of what's in someone's genome, what's likely to go wrong with them, if they're sick, what that is, and which medicines will start to work with them. The DNA has been cut up into lots of little fragments, and for each of those fragments that's in the machine, it's doing a little readout of that section of the genome. Taking the readout of all of those different bits, you can put it together and work out what the whole three billion letter code of the whole genome is, the best readout you can get of it. And then you can work out how you zoom in on the bits that are relevant to that person's problems. This is thought to be the first instance of genome sequencing being used as a routine part of healthcare. But generally, advances in genomic technology have rapidly reduced diagnostic wait times for many genetic conditions. These faster, cheaper sequencing technologies allow us to read that whole genome in just a few days and at a cost of less than £1,000 per genome. So the faster, cheaper sequencing is really enabling that genetic testing to be pushed out and be accessible across healthcare. To help health professionals make the most of this new technology, Health Education England's Genomics Education Programme has developed a range of online resources. It needs to be very targeted and specific education that's relevant for whatever their, their cl current clinical practice. So, um, you know, that is basic genomic literacy, so you, you kind of know what the terminology means and what the tests mean, but also how that can affect your practice. You know, so um, who are the patients you would be referring and what are the specific um, issues that relate to those conditions. And then really important is recognising when you need to have more information and then being easily signposted to additional resources for you and your patients. A new resource called GeNote is addressing that need for targeted education. So they're all written to this template around a scenario and then these are the hooks for learning that are peppered throughout that tier one resource. So for instance, we could follow this one here into gene panel sequencing. We've now dived into the tier two knowledge hub. We're now extending our learning. Hello, matey. Patients like Georgia can now get the care they need thanks to advances in genomic technologies. After several years, she discovered her lack of growth and development was down to a form of dwarfism. Without a diagnosis, you always think the worst. So once we got the diagnosis, it was almost like, phew, thank oh, yeah. goodness for that. Because although she still has the problems that she had, we knew that it shouldn't get any worse the year should help and things will improve over time. In the UK we're leading the world in genomic um, diagnoses and um, while we use that as a diagnostic tool to find the conditions we already know about, we're also using the tool to un understand conditions that previously haven't been recognised by medicine. And that means some of the families that have been stuck in a diagnostic odyssey for eight, ten, 15 years or so are finally getting the, um, the genetic um, code for what's caused their problem. The pharmaceutical company Kioa Kirin really understands how this long wait in the diagnostic hinterland can impact on patients with rare diseases. Because it's a rare disease, uh, many doctors may not be familiar with uh, how to diagnose this specific disease when the patient shows up. So this then translates to patients maybe going 
you know, doctor to doctor for many months, sometimes many years before they get the correct diagnosis. So as a company, what we're trying to do is raise the level of awareness and education for both patients and doctors to try and shorten that diagnostic journey to make it as quick as possible. We need to appreciate the difficulty in living with these diseases uh, for patients, carers, as well as family members. From diagnosis to quality of life, and we need to do whatever we can in partnership with patients, carers, groups, to understand how we can make life better for them. Earlier diagnosis and better treatment. More emphasis is being placed on giving patients a voice. Patients understand best what is important for them and we need to listen to them. We need to ask them what they think are the gaps and see what we can do to actually generate the evidence and give the information that is critical for their well-being. Eurodis is an alliance of patient organisations pushing for Target to achieve real results. It's critical for the 30 million persons living with rare disease in Europe. With this European plan by 2030, we want to reduce the time to diagnose from four years to six months. We want to improve the survival by three years on the average for all people living with rare diseases. Getting the right information in the right place in order to best help the millions of rare disease patients around the world is crucial. Costello Medical is using innovation to gather valuable data about rare diseases in a structured way. We do a lot of what's called real-world evidence, capturing um, insights from the community that are most representative of those that will receive the treatment in the real world. These insights from the experts, the patients themselves, their families and healthcare professionals are then collated on the company's Delphi app, which then shows where there is common ground. And it helps you get at both quantitative information but also qualitative information, which can be very, very hard to collect in a robust and systematic way. The app allows design and analysis of surveys on one platform, making it easier to gather opinion from all the stakeholders. This allows pharmaceutical companies to use the data to help inform decisions on whether a treatment might be cost effective or not. What Costello does is really valuable because it's going to be undertaken in a very structured manner with some formal processes and those are the sorts of things that committees are looking for to be able to say actually this trial or the evidence that was created has been designed in a constructive manner. This kind of creative thinking is what's needed to bring balance to some of the current methods of assessing treatments. In rare diseases it's absolutely crucial because a lot of people just don't understand the disease. There's often not great ways of measuring the impact of a treatment. So imagine a parent whose child needs less intense care, is more independent, what that could mean to them. They might be less worried or anxious about the future, they might be able to go back to work and so on. Clinical trials do not assess that, they're focusing on efficacy and safety, so we need other ways of assessing this. It really requires this all-hands-on-deck approach of the different stakeholders working together. That's exactly what pharmaceutical company BioChrist is doing, working alongside advocacy groups and clinicians to understand patients' needs and support shared decision-making. Anne Harding's daughter Shan lives with HAE, or hereditary angioedema, it's a condition which can cause symptoms such as unexplained swelling, excruciating pain and vomiting. Throat or facial swellings can be life-threatening if the airways become blocked. Because it's so rare, it can be misdiagnosed. It's thought there are around 1,500 people in the UK with HAE. I personally believe there's more that haven't been diagnosed because getting a diagnosis is very difficult. Um, as obviously you know it can mimic other illnesses. It might take a doctor 10 years before he sees one HAE patient. People living with the condition can face a lack of knowledge when they need emergency treatment. It takes 10 years before they might see one HAE patient because it's a rare disease. We've had um, circumstances when um, our patients carry their medication with a letter explaining exactly what the disease is and what medication they should use and they've gone to an accident emergency department where uh, instead of administering the medication immediately, 
uh, the healthcare professionals there have taken a long time to try fathom what actually it means. And that, that's because of poor education. Um, and it's inevitable because it is a rare disease. Nikki was lucky enough to be diagnosed early and manages her treatment with her doctor. The medication you're taking now might not be appropriate for the next 20, 30, 40 years. You might want to have children, you might want to have a different career path. Um, so and career paths will do medicals on you and things like that. So you are better to have that open, frank discussion with the physician to see what is your best path for medication. For us to truly understand how the disease manifests itself, and how it affects patients on a day-to-day -day basis helps us develop drugs to help support them to, to have a normal life, essentially. Many years ago, there was maybe only one or two treatments. Now there's a number of treatments in HAE. And having that shared decision-making between the patient and the physician is really important. The relationships between rare disease patients and their healthcare teams take on an extra dimension when thinking about the psychological impact on them and their families. Rare genetic disease, which is unknown, where there's perhaps not good treatments or prognosis about, is devastating. The more, the more destructive the disorder, the worse the psychological adjustment, the more devastating it can be for the family. Seeing the same team throughout diagnosis and treatment helps enormously. As more young patients survive into adulthood, the transition is carefully managed. So we spend a lot of time focusing on the transition uh, of our young people um, to adulthood, um, and we take several years over um, that gradual transition from childhood to adulthood, from childhood care under paediatricians like myself to adult care under adult sort of rare disease specialists. We try and see the patients initially in a place of great security and safety, i.e. in the paediatric sector, several times. We obviously talk closely to the clinicians and the other specialists uh, so that we know the story of that individual patient and their individual needs so that we can personalise their care when we move them into adult practice. There's better management of complications that can arise from rare diseases now, and survival rates are increasing thanks to work being done by companies like Sanofi, who are keen to continue their decades-long interest in this area by working with partners to find solutions. We believe that there are three areas that we need to partner in and collaborate in. The first is the use of big data uh, to find the undiagnosed patients. The second is around diagnostic testing and the infrastructure uh, that's set up for that. And then the third is around you know, rapid and sustainable access to therapies. Fleur Chandler understands only too well the struggles that families living with rare disease face. Her son Dominic has the terminal disease Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where his muscles, including his heart, get progressively weaker as head of market access at Sanofi, she brings that experience to fight for rare disease medicines to be more accessible. My whole career has been around ensuring that uh, patients in the UK can get access to, to medicines by trying to demonstrate the value of those medicines. And while working at Sanofi, I can really continue to do that and also bring my personal experience now into my professional life. The main issue with rare diseases is that there are so many of them some of which make life unbearable. Imagine internal itching so bad that you would risk life-threatening surgery to make it stop. The kind of itch that Eleanor experienced was from the inside out. So it was a bit like, um, the way I used to think of it was her inter internal organs were, were itching and she couldn't get to them. And her blood was itching, but she couldn't get to it. Eleanor suffered from progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis, or PFIC, a liver disease with a high risk of cancer, and daily pruritus, uncontrollable itching. It's caused by a malfunction in the transport of bile around the body, leading to a buildup in the liver, spilling over into the blood, causing liver damage and itching. Biopharmaceutical company Albi Rayo is one of a number of businesses investing heavily in research to address rare liver diseases like PFIC. Experts say research is key to prevent disease progression and reduce the need for surgery. 
we've gone to all sorts of lengths to try and improve the symptoms of these patients. Um, but uh, to cut a long story short, many of those patients have ended up having liver transplants, specifically because the quality of life and the itch is so bad. And to put a child through a major surgery like that, actually putting their life at risk as a consequence because of a symptom like itch will probably sound extraordinary to most people, but that is the, the nature of what we're talking about. It's sufficiently bad that families readily did that to try and cure the problem. It can be really, really debilitating and can be something that affects all sorts of normal aspects of a normal life and, and make things incredibly difficult. I think we have to focus more on each individual rare disease. I think we have to focus on screening for these diseases. And once we've found treatments that work, it's a case of getting them to the people that need them as soon as possible. And that will really transform the outlook for the lives of patients with these rare conditions. The Wellcome Centre for Mitochondrial Research is taking that specialist focus and working directly with patients to inform their science. Research is concentrated on finding new treatments for mitochondrial dysfunction. One of the things that really kind of spurred me on was actually seeing just how bad mitochondrial diseases are, which is something I think with other areas of research and other centres you don't really get that interaction with patients and it really focuses the mind on trying to develop the treatments. There is currently no cure for mitochondrial disease, which is when the energy-creating mitochondria in our body cells malfunctions. Symptoms vary and can develop out of the blue. On the Monday, we kept her home from school, having felt just genuinely unwell. On the Tuesday morning, we woke up and she was having a massive seizure. And within an hour, she was put in intensive care. She's gone from being a very independent young girl at 15 year old to a very dependent young lady. We need all health care professionals. When you come into that first point of access, be it a GP, an emergency unit, someone just think, could this be mitochondrial disease? If you see two organs involved, think about it. Or if you think something just doesn't fit, think mitochondrial disease. We're quite delighted to be in the mitochondrial research unit here today. You don't realise what goes on behind the scenes and in terms of the research that is actually being done. It's actually very interesting. And it's put my mind at ease because sometimes I'm just like, have it even doing anything about this. I'm really impressed. It really has given me some hope for her future just visiting here today. Engagement, awareness and research continue to be the way forward. I've always been struck by that important mantra of rare but potentially treatable and that, that really is what we want to do. We want patient-focused research to guide our treatments for today and more treatments for tomorrow. We've moved an awful long way in the last 30 years and I'm hoping it will continue. All reports from shining a light on rare conditions can be found in full at the Genetic Alliance UK website. The details are on the screen now. From me and the team here at ITM Productions, thank you for watching. Goodbye.